Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Gregory, and I am the Interim Dean of the College of Arts and Letters at the University of Toledo, and I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to the 2023 Maurice and Ramsey Mikhail Memorial Lecture, which is one of the college's longest running lecture series and certainly one that we're very proud of. This series is supported by a university foundation fund for an annual lecture dedicated to topics on Arab culture and the Middle East, including issues of peace and justice. It has a long tradition of hosting exceptionally high quality speakers, including but not limited to Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, award-winning poet Moja Kaf, and American Book Award winner Leila Lalami, among many others. Today is no exception in that each speaker on this panel is a highly credentialed expert. I will say that this year's lecture has taken more of a journey than our past events in that our original speaker was NPR Morning Edition co-host uh, Leila Fadl, who is scheduled to speak live here on campus on October 12th. But when the Hamas attack on October 7th occurred, Leila was called away to cover it, which left the Mikhail Lecture Series without a speaker for the first time in its 22 year history. The committee that selects the annual speaker very quickly regrouped to discuss alternatives. And as international events unfolded, and as news reports and particularly social media seemed increasingly inadequate as modes of understanding what was happening, the committee members saw an opportunity to use the lecture to provide a nuanced and thoughtful conversation on an incredibly difficult subject. So they turned to the idea of a panel because like all complex subjects, um, they're often best served by convening multiple viewpoints. In that sense, the committee's decision to offer this panel mirrors, I think, the dynamic of the public university. As a public institution of higher education, the University of Toledo provides an inclusive space of dialogue where individuals with different and often passionate perspectives gather to explore challenging questions. Our mission is to educate individuals so that they can engage in debate with knowledge, care, and intent. And we appreciate all of you joining us in that mission today. So with that, I would like to turn this event over to John McKyle, who will be moderating the panel for today. John is the Carroll Professor of Jurisprudence at Georgetown University Law Center. He teaches and writes on a variety of topics, including constitutional law, moral and legal theory, and human rights. He served for three years as the law school's associate dean for research and academic programs, and for two years as its associate dean for international and transnational programs. So thank you very much. And John, I will hand this to you. Thanks, Melissa. And thank you to everyone at the University of Toledo and the College of Arts and Letters for hosting this webinar. To save time, I'll give only brief introductions of our panelists, which won't do justice to their many accomplishments. Sari Bashi is an Israeli-American human rights lawyer and the program director at Human Rights Watch, where she leads the organization's research programs and supervises a staff of 270 people in 50 countries. Before joining Human Rights Watch, she clerked for the Israeli Supreme Court and co-founded and ran Gisha, the leading human rights a group in Israel promoting the right to freedom of movement for Palestinians in Gaza. Sari has taught international humanitarian law at Yale Law School and Tel Aviv University. She is also the author of the award-winning Hebrew language book, Makluba, Upside Down Love, a story about love in the shadow of the Israeli occupation. Tom Dannenbaum is associate professor of international law at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University where he is also co-director of the Center for International Law and Governance and co-director of the school's LLM program. Before joining Fletcher, he taught at University College London and Yale Law School. Tom writes on the law of armed conflict, international criminal law, human rights, and other international law topics. His articles have received multiple awards, including a legal scholarship prize from the American Society of International Law for his work on siege starvation, and its Lieber Prize for his work on the crime of aggression. Adil Hawk is professor of law and the Judge John O. Newman Scholar at Rutgers Law School, where he co-directs the Rutgers Institute for Law and Philosophy. Before joining Rutgers, he clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and worked as an associate at Debevoise and Plimpton. Adil's scholarship focus, focuses on the law of armed conflict and the philosophy of international law. His book, Law and Morality at War, 
has earned wide acclaim from both philosophers and international lawyers. He is an executive editor of the national security blog, Just Security, and serves on the boards of several leading philosophy and international law journals. So thank you all for being here. I'd like to begin by asking each of you to take a few minutes to frame and introduce our main topic today, which is the war and humanitarian crisis in Gaza. From your perspective as specialists on human rights and international law, how should we understand these events? What are the basic laws of war? And are the parties to this conflict complying with them? Tom, let me begin with you. Could you start us off by laying out the basic framework of how international law applies to armed conflicts like this, both with respect to when armed force can be used and how it must be used, and also whether the precise legal status of Gaza makes any difference in this regard? After you respond, I'll invite Sari and Adil to build on your remarks and offer any initial comments that they'd like to add before turning to more specific questions. Tom? Well, first of all, thank you, John, for that introduction and for convening this panel. Um, it's a privilege to participate in this conversation. I think what we've been seeing develop over the last two plus months since October 7th in Israel and Palestine is self-evidently catastrophic. International law offers a limited framework with a set of tools for addressing that, but it inevitably cannot capture every aspect of that catastrophe. Nonetheless, there are certain legal regimes that can identify violations, responsible parties, and provide the underpinning for accountability and the channels through which to pursue that accountability, as well as providing the focal point for political mobilization towards ending this catastrophe. So there are, I think, five legal frameworks that might be relevant here. The law governing the resort to force, which is when or whether states can go to or perpetuate war the law governing the conduct of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, which is about how parties to a conflict can fight and how they must protect in the course of fighting, international criminal law, which underpins individual criminal responsibility. In other words, it's the grounding for individual criminal punishment at the international level, human rights law, which governs how states must treat those who are under their control, and international refugee law, which relates to asylum and refugee protection. I'll focus primarily on the first two, but I think at least the first three will probably come up in multiple ways in our conversation. So on the law governing the resort to force, this question of when and whether states can go to war, to put it in simple terms, or perpetuate war, continue a war once they're in it. The basic rule is that states may not resort to force in their international relations unless they either have authorization from the Security Council, which is not a relevant category here, or are acting in self-defense or in defense of another state. In principle, one might think self-defense is a relatively straightforward category, but it is complicated in this particular context for a number of reasons. First of all, it's complicated to understand precisely how it relates to a situation of prolonged occupation. Secondly, it's complicated because of the ongoing contestation, admittedly, I think now relatively marginal contestation, but nonetheless contestation certainly by Israel, the United States and others regarding Palestinian statehood. And third, the complication arising from the fact that regardless of one's position on that question, the question of Palestinian statehood, very few would recognize Hamas and the other armed groups operating in Gaza as anything other than non-state armed groups. All of those things complicate how we should apply non, uh, apply the law governing the resort to force in this particular context. But I think it would be a mistake to get drawn into the weeds of those complexities, because even assuming the broadest understanding of the authority to resort to force as a matter of self-defense, self-defense does not provide a blank check. First of all, internal to the law governing the resort to force, Defense can only be authorized legally insofar as it is necessary and proportionate to the threat to which it responds. Adul has written compellingly on the degree to which the current Israeli resort to force in Gaza is not compliant with the principle of proportionality in that respect. I'll defer to him to elaborate on that. I agree with his analysis. Moreover, regardless of which party has the right to resort to force, which party therefore has the authority on this question of when or whether to go to war, 
there's a second layer on which there's not a blank check here, and that's that all parties to every armed conflict, regardless of who's in the right regard, regarding its initiation and perpetuation, is required to comply with international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict. And that provides a series of significant rules in this particular context. Most fundamentally, the requirement to distinguish in all military operations between civilians, the civilian population and civilian objects on the one hand, and combatants and military objectives on the other hand, and to direct exclusively and discreetly one's military operations against the latter category. The obligation to take all feasible precautions to minimize civilian harm in the context of such operations, and the obligation not to engage in those operations at all if the civilian harm arising from them or expected to arise from them would be excessive in relation to the military advantage from those attacks and operations. There are also a series of specific protections relating to hospitals, food, water and other essentials, medical supplies and cultural heritage, for example. There are rules relating to humanitarian access, rules relating to detainee treatment and detention in the first instance, rules relating to the exploitation of these rules in ways that endanger others, such as the use of human shields. And there's also an important subcategory of international humanitarian law, which is the law of belligerent occupation. And this applies when one state controls the territory of another state without the latter's consent and in a way that displaces the sovereign's authority or capability of asserting its authority in that territory. And that matters because it implicates a higher set of obligations for the occupying power. For example, with respect to moving populations in and out of that territory, and also with respect to ensuring, to the fullest extent of the means available to it, the full food, medical, and other essential supply to that population. In this particular context, to go back to your question about the complicated status of Gaza, although it's relatively clear that Israel has been the occupying power in the West Bank since 1967, there's some dispute among international lawyers as to whether it remained the occupying, in Gaza follow, occupying power in Gaza following the unilateral withdrawal in 2005, my view is that it is because of the perimeter control that it retained over Gaza during the period since 2005, but it is at least disputed, and that therefore implicates this question of when these heightened requirements relating to the law of belligerent occupation attach. The final thing I'll just say is there's then this additional regime of international criminal law, one component of which is war crimes law, which relates to serious violations of this international humanitarian law framework, but it also includes crimes against humanity and genocide, and that's the body of law that underpins jurisdiction at the International Criminal Court, but also potentially jurisdiction in foreign domestic courts that would not have otherwise an ordinary jurisdictional nexus. So I'll leave it there and, and leave it to Sari and Adil to, to elaborate on some of those issues, but that's the basic framework we're dealing with. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive answer. Sari, can I turn to you and invite you to make um, initial comments that uh, that you'd like to add? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and maybe what I can do is uh, choose uh, two or three of the legal frameworks that Tom so helpfully outlined and um, share with you uh, a, um, a challenge that Human Rights Watch is having, that I'm having, and maybe many of you are having in talking about what's been going on um, in Israel-Palestine um, over the last few months, uh, because I think this conversation is is very fraught, and I can share why it's fraught for us. Um, International humanitarian law enshrines very basic principles of humanity that apply to everybody all the time, and they're non-reciprocal. Um, so the fact that one side is violating uh, principles of international humanitarian law doesn't mean you get to do it. And the reason for that is that they are essentially a commitment that all the nations of the world make to humanity, not to each other. And one of the things that's been so difficult uh, for the past two months is to um, hold that duality that Israeli civilians need to be protected full stop and targeting them, killing them, taking them hostage. Those are war crimes, full stop. And Palestinian civilians need to be protected full stop, deliberately depriving them of um, life-saving humanitarian relief, engaging in collective punishment. Um, attacking them in ways that violate the international law protections that attach to civilians, those are unlawful and in some cases war crimes, no matter what everybody else does. And there are certainly people who care a lot about Israeli civilians, as they should, 
and there are people who care a lot about Palestinian civilians, as they should, but there aren't enough people in that Venn diagram of caring about both. Um, and that's been uh, a challenge for, for human rights activists and, and frankly, for international humanitarian lawyers who know that these principles are universal. The second kind of duality has a little bit more to do with human rights law and criminal law. Um, and it has to do with some of the root causes of the current escalation. So October 7th was an unprecedented uh, massacre, certainly in Israeli history, and the hostilities that erupted in Gaza are also unprecedented in terms of the, the numbers of people killed and the, the, the depth and extent of the violence. This didn't start on October 7th. And one of the things that is, is difficult in, in trying to have these conversations is to explain that nothing justifies the attacks of October 7th, because the responsibilities not to target civilians are non-reciprocal and not negotiable. And before October 7th, there were crimes against humanity being committed and still being committed against Palestinians. And it's difficult to separate those crimes against humanity from the violence that's taking place now. So in particular, um, for the past while, the Israeli authorities have been committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution, which are essentially violations of human rights law and uh, international humanitarian law that are so severe that they rise to that level. Um, so the crime of apartheid um, and similarly, the crime of persecution is when um, authorities seek to maintain the domination of one racial group over another in a context of systematic oppression and through the commission of inhumane acts. And one of the ways that the Israeli authorities are engaging in that is by seeking to maintain Jewish demographic superiority over Palestinians in the area controlled by the Israeli authorities, Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank, through the commission of inhumane acts. That particularly relates to Gaza because part of the reason why the conditions in Gaza were so bad even before this violence were because of a very uh, difficult closure that the Israeli military had imposed on Gaza for at least the past 16 years, not letting people travel back and forth um, in ways that were very uh, difficult for the humanitarian situation as well as the economic situation in Gaza. And the fact that people in Gaza, 70% of the people in Gaza are refugees uh, from what is now Israel and their descendants, um, people who have a right to return to the homes they left behind in Israel. And the intent behind the closure and the intent behind not letting those refugees return have to do with that goal of demographic superiority. Um, and there are similar uh, acts, inhumane acts being committed in the West Bank as well. But it's not an accident that the violence um, began in Gaza. And if we look at the history of Israel-Palestine for the last few decades, things tend to start in Gaza uh, because of how many refugees are there and because of the severity of the Israeli control over Gaza, the way that it is expressed for folks in Gaza. And it's been very difficult to try to um, explain to people that none of that justifies what armed groups did to Israeli civilians on October 7th, and that we also have to understand those root causes in order to understand the violence of today. Thank you. Uh, Adil, let me turn to you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm still reflecting on uh, Tom and Sarah's remarks, and I, I, I uh, agree with them wholeheartedly. Um, I want to say a little bit more about uh, self-defense and maybe a bit about self-determination uh, by way of framing our remarks, because I, I think we are going to spend much of our conversation talking about uh, international humanitarian law, the conduct of hostilities, um, and 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 other issues. So I think it's important to say a little bit about these these broader issues. Uh, so as Tom said, I, I think it's useful to grant for the sake of discussion that all these legal complexities about the preconditions for the right of self-defense are satisfied and then evaluate Israel's military operation on that basis. And, and there are really three internal limitations on the right of self-defense that I don't think have gotten enough attention. 
So the first is that the mainstream view in international law is that the legitimate aim of self-defense is to halt and repel an ongoing armed attack and perhaps uh, anticipate an imminent one. But when the armed attack ends or can end, then the right of self-defense lapses. So by way of analogy, when Russia invades Ukraine, this is clearly an armed attack, an armed aggression, Ukraine has the right of self-defense, but Ukraine's war aim is not to uh, overrun Russian forces, march on Moscow, and burn the Kremlin to the ground. It is to um, uh, repel Russian forces from Ukraine uh, and then stop and defend Ukraine's borders from, from future aggression. So the first striking feature of Israel's military campaign is that its aim is uh, not simply to uh, reach a ceasefire agreement or recover uh, the still over 100 hostages who remain uh, unlawfully in um, captivity, but to destroy Hamas as a political and military organization. So the first question is whether that's a legitimate aim at all. The second is whether the military campaign is necessary to achieve that aim, uh, given that it is now seems pretty clear that Israel knew that Hamas was planning a major operation, um, failed to uh, take steps to prevent it from unfolding or rapidly suppress it when it began, including redeploying forces away from the southern border, to, border toward the West Bank. It's very hard to justify killing thousands of civilians to prevent the recurrence of atrocities that could have been prevented in the first place. And finally, as Tom mentioned, there's this issue of proportionality. And in this context, proportional, pro proportionality refers uh, not to the effects of a single strike, but to the cumulative harm inflicted on civilians by a military campaign as a whole. And I think that when you compare the total harm that it has been, is being, and will be inflicted on Gazan civilians by Israel's military campaign, and you compare it with um, the additional level of security that Israel might gain, by destroying Hamas rather than um, uh, recovering their hostages, accepting a ceasefire and protecting their southern border, it is hard to see a proportion between that harm and that defensive benefit. And I think it's useful to keep that in mind because certainly in the West, in the United States and elsewhere, the framework has been Israel has a right of self-defense, but it must exercise that right in compliance with international humanitarian law. And that leaves out these internal limitations on the right of self-defense itself. So I wanna briefly say something about the right of self-determination, which is another legal framework for thinking about the conflict. So the Palestinian people as a whole enjoy a right of self-determination, uh, the right to direct their collective lives, whether in the form of a state uh, or otherwise. And the forcible denial of self-determination uh, including through prolonged occupation, is a violation of international law. In principle, this violation can uh, give rise to a right of resistance on the part of the people whose self-determination is being denied. However, it's very important to remember two things. The first is that resistance to uh, forcible denials of self-determination is itself bound by international humanitarian law. And so national liberation movements must respect civilian immunity and the uh, intransgressible principles of international humanitarian law. And this is not a Western imposition on the oppressed peoples of the uh, global South. On the contrary, it was third world international lawyers throughout the 1960s and 1970s who insisted that national liberation movements should be subject to international humanitarian law. They must respect uh, the legal protections of civilians um, as they seek um, uh, their goals, whether statehood or, or otherwise. And so from that uh, perspective, the atrocities and crimes committed by Hamas on October 7th are not just violations of international humanitarian law and war crimes, they are simply not exercises of the right of resistance in the first place. Uh, the right of resistance is not, um, it does not even extend uh, to acts of such uh, inhumanity. And I think that's important to bear in mind. Um, the last thing I'll say about that is that in my own view, um, only a group or a movement who represents the people as a whole 
can exercise the right of resistance on their behalf. And it is my view that Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people as a whole. And so there is no sense in which their military operations are an exercise of the right of resistance uh, and certainly not the right of self-determination. Thank you. So many important topics have already been raised, but I'd like to now invite you to go deeper um, on some specific questions. Um, sorry, I'd like to begin with you and ask you to say a bit more about the crimes and atrocities committed by Hamas on October 7th. Uh, one often hears that Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank are a people under occupation who have an inherent right to resist. Nonetheless, it's widely recognized that Hamas committed many atrocities on October 7th, including murder, sexual violence, and the taking of hostages. How would you characterize what happened on October 7th? What does international law have to say about it? And perhaps more importantly, what mechanisms of accountability exist for these crimes? How should Israel or any country attacked in this way have responded? Well, thank you for that. And, and I would certainly ag agree with Adil that uh, nothing justifies um, the kinds of war crimes that were committed on October 7th, no matter what kind of um, resistance people are engaged in. Um, so, I mean, international humanitarian law would uh, treat the fighters who crossed over from Israel into Gaza um, as civilians uh, directly participating in the hostilities. Um, so Human Rights Watch takes the position that the conflict between the Israeli military and armed groups in Gaza is a non-international armed conflict. Um, the, the people engaging in the violence uh, on the Palestinian side are not members of regular armies, they're civilians who are directly participating in hostilities. And for such time as they continue that direct participation, they uh, may be targeted uh, in the way that fighters can be. Um, it, it was led by Hamas, but there were additional Palestinian armed groups who joined, as well as people who were not affiliated with armed groups, but joined in the violence. And all of those would have lost their civilian protections for such time as they participated in the violence. Um, the, 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 the basic uh, acts that took place violated that very uh, basic principle of protecting civilians. So in some cases, the fighters who, or the gunmen who crossed over uh, targeted uh, Israeli soldiers, but mostly they targeted Israeli civilians, um, including deliberate killings. Um, uh, there's evidence of sexual violence as well, uh, hostage taking, um, and those are war crimes. Um, and there may be additional legal definitions that attach to those acts. Uh, and Human Rights Watch is engaged in um, investigations of October 7th so that we can also look at questions of command responsibility, who did what, uh, and what were the orders. Um, in terms of accountability, I, I mean, the first line of, of defense for accountability would be domestic criminal law. Um, so the Israeli authorities did capture some of those fighters, um, and those, uh, those people can be tried in Israeli uh, criminal proceedings. Um, the Palestinian authorities also would be expected to try those people uh, for uh, crimes, but that's unlikely to happen um, because the uh, Hamas uh, authorities in Gaza, aside from the fact that they're not really functioning very well right now, um, obviously backed that attack. So it's unlikely that they're going to then um, try people for those crimes. And the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank um, is, is doesn't have any authority to try those people because they're not in control in Gaza. So that leaves us with additional international mechanisms, in particular the International Criminal Court, um, which has jurisdiction over serious crimes committed in Palestine since 2014. Uh, the prosecutor uh, of that court, there's an open investigation um, into the situation in Palestine. Palestine is a member of the ICC, but Israel is not. However, the prosecutor has made it clear that he uh, has jurisdiction. He sees the court as having jurisdiction over the crimes that were committed in Israel as well. Uh, and that's because they were planned in Palestine. So that would be enough to attach for jurisdiction. And so we would expect that um, the people who engaged in the atrocities of October 7th um, would be investigated uh, as part of the ICC investigation. There's also a commission of inquiry that the United Nations Human Rights Council established in May of 2021 to investigate human rights abuses uh, in Israel and Palestine, and they um, are also conducting an investigation. Um, the last line of defense would be universal jurisdiction. Um, these crimes are serious enough that any country in the world 
would be encouraged to investigate and prosecute. Thank you. Tom, almost immediately after the October 7th attacks, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant announced that Israel would impose a complete siege on the Gaza Strip, including no electricity, no food, and no fuel. He also said, we are fighting human animals and would act accordingly. A few days later, you wrote an essay on just security, analyzing the siege and what you called the starvation war crime. Could you summarize the argument that you made in that essay and explain what is and is not lawful with respect to depriving civilian populations of basic necessities during armed conflicts? Are food, water, medicine, and other basic essentials being unlawfully prevented from reaching the Gaza Strip? And what are the obligations of Israel, Egypt, and other nations with respect to this issue? Yeah, so there are a number of rules in international humanitarian law that are relevant to this issue. The first is the umbrella prohibition of starvation of civilians as a method of warfare. The second is the prohibition on attacking, destroying, removing, or rendering useless objects indispensable to civilian survival, either for the purpose of denying their sustenance value, including denying that sustenance value to combatants where civilians are also affected, or for other purposes, purposes other than sustenance denial, where that deprivation would leave the civilian population so inadequately supplied as to cause its starvation or force its movement. There are then additional rules relating to humanitarian access, the prohibition on arbitrarily denying consent to humanitarian actors seeking to reach a population that's inadequately supplied. And as I mentioned earlier, there are these heightened obligations applying to occupying powers, namely the obligation to itself ensure the full food, medical and other essential supply of the civilian population. These rules, particularly the first three that I mentioned, underpin a war crime. That war crime is the war crime of starvation of civilians as a method of warfare. It's not a war crime that's been prosecuted at the international level, so there's not jurisprudence at the international level precisely identifying its contours. But in thinking about what it means in interpreting the crime, there are a number of things that we should bear in mind. The first is that a civilian population which is to say a population that is predominantly civilian does not lose its civilian character simply in virtue of the presence of combatants within that population. In my view, it's unambiguous that the population of Gaza as a whole is a civilian population, notwithstanding the presence of tens of thousands of combatants within that population of over 2 million people. So it's a civilian population and therefore any operation on the population as a whole is an operation directed at a civilian population. The second key foundational point to bear in mind before we even get into the specifics of the starvation prohibition is that there's a basic rule of international humanitarian law, which is codified in Article 48 of Additional Protocol 1, which is the requirement to distinguish in all military operations, not simply kinetic attacks, but all military operations between civilians and the civilian population on the one hand, and combatants and military objectives on the other. That's those two really principles are the principles that underpin a clear prohibition, for example, on indiscriminately targeting the population of Gaza as a whole. In other words, it wouldn't be sufficient to say, well, our goal, our ultimate goal is to kill and eliminate Hamas fighters within Gaza, but the means through which we're going to do that is to carpet bomb the entire population. That would be a clearly prohibited attack on a civilian population and a clearly prohibited indiscriminate attack, and it would be a war crime. My view is that we should think about the prohibition of salvation of civilians as a method of warfare similarly, that when there's indiscriminate deprivation of the civilian population, the prohibition attaches. And this is underpinned by thinking about the umbrella prohibition of salvation of civilians as a method of warfare as connected to and informed by the protection of objects indispensable to civilian survival under international humanitarian law. And what that means is the prohibition attaches whenever there's the deliberate deprivation of objects indispensable to civilian survival, such as food, water, medicines, and other essentials, with either the purpose of denying their sustenance value to a population which, at least on the aggregate level, is civilian, regardless of the motive, or 
in a context in which there's another purpose, but the virtual certain virtually certain consequence is the salvation of the civilian population. Applying this concretely to the specifics of this case, in the first instance, that October 9th declaration by Defence Minister Yoav Gallant that you mentioned, in my view, clearly implicated the first form of that prohibition. It was deprivation, including of food and water, which were clearly being deprived for their sustenance value. There was no claim that food was providing any other kind of military utility other than sustenance. It was deprived to a population that was civilian as a whole, regardless of whether the goal was to squeeze combatants, Hamas combatants within Gaza or not. And it therefore implicated the prohibition of salvation of civilians as a method of warfare. Following October 21st, when we started to see aid going in, there was, I think, arguably still a policy of sustenance denial, given the very limited aid that was allowed in and several points at which it became clear that that was a deliberate choice to limit the amount of aid going in. But even if one thought that beyond that point, once some limited supply starts to come in, it was no longer a deliberate policy of sustenance denial, there came a point when every independent, impartial humanitarian actor in this area was warning of the imminent threat of starvation, particularly of children. And at that point, the virtual certainty that starvation would arise, regardless of the purpose for which aid was being impeded, implicated the starvation war crime again, in my view. You also asked about the question of other actors' responsibilities here, particularly Egypt, but also others. The first thing to say about that is that on this obligation to allow rapid and unimpeded humanitarian access, that applies to all states, not just the parties to the conflict. And so Egypt has an obligation to allow rapid and unimpeded humanitarian access and not to itself be obstructing humanitarian deliveries into Gaza. Secondly, all states have an obligation to ensure respect for international humanitarian law, including by using the influence they have over parties to the conflict to bring them into compliance. That includes states with significant influence because of weapons supplies, such as the United States, but also states that are acting in some level of cooperation with Israel regarding border access, such as Egypt. It's also the case that where there's a substantial contribution to a war crime, and it's known that that substantial contribution will in fact contribute to this war crime in that way, there can be complicit responsibility for specific individual actors, including individual members of other states. And finally, although forced transfer and forced deportation is itself a war crime and one that we may touch on later, if a population arrives at the border or a number of civilians arrive at the border, seeking refuge in Egypt. It cannot turn them away at the border where there is a well-founded fear of persecution or arbitrary deprivation of life. And so it does have obligations with respect to refugee as access at its border. And that is potentially also implicated here, notwithstanding the fact that the reason that people might be seeking to access that refuge, or that asylum, is because they are fleeing a crime of forced deportation or forced transfer. Thank you. I'd like to turn uh, now to the targeting practices of the IDF and ask you, Adil, to uh, uh, discuss them. Um, as with its previous campaigns in Gaza, the IDF's targeting practices in this war have come under critical scrutiny. A recent article by a prominent military analyst in foreign affairs calls Israel's assault one of the most intense bombing campaigns in history, which has killed over 15,000 civilians including more than 6,000 children, and caused nearly 2 million Palestinians to flee their homes. Noting that Israel has bombed hospitals and ambulances and wrecked about half of northern Gaza's buildings, the author concludes that, by any definition, this campaign counts as a massive act of collective punishment against civilians. Another recent article by Israeli journalist Yuval Abraham goes even further, labeling Israel's bombing campaign, a mass assassination factory. Can you please discuss the principles of distinction, proportionality, and other elements of IHL that are supposed to protect civilians during armed conflicts? And explain whether you think the IDF is complying with them. And can you also address the attacks on hospitals, ambulances, and medical personnel in particular, which are generally thought to have special protected status under international law? 
Thanks, John. Um, so given the scale of the IDF's mi military campaign, you know, it, it, it's hard to discuss everything. So I'm just going to choose a couple of, um, of topics. So first, as Tom mentioned, there's a very basic prohibition against attacks on individual civilians or civilian objects. Um, with respect to the IDF's targeting campaign, uh, at the very beginning of the war, Israel announced that one of its goals was to destroy not only Hamas's military capability, but also its capacity to govern Gaza. And what we've seen in Israel's targeting practices has been a targeting of uh, government officials and government buildings, uh, which appear to be civilian. Uh, so the IDF has uh, targeted uh, a finance minister, a head of internal relations, a preacher, members of the judicial branch, members of the political bureau, members of the Gaza Legislative Council. Um, these individuals may be part of Hamas as a political movement or of its political wing. They do not appear to be members of Hamas's military wing, and they appear, at least on their face, to be civilians, not part of the military chain of command within Hamas. We've seen also seen uh, a number of attacks on what are apparently called power targets uh, within the, the Israeli establishment. These include parliament buildings, courthouses, banks, universities, a bar association, um, uh, uh, various government ministries, uh, often in context where there's actually no active fighting going on and the buildings are simply being, uh, being destroyed. And these two would appear to be uh, civilian objects uh, at the time that they are destroyed. We've also seen a uh, very large scale destruction of uh, civilian homes, especially large uh, apartment buildings and and um, uh, and residential towers. It, the article that you uh, described, uh, which was originally published by 972 and local call, but later confirmed by The Guardian, uh, indicates that in these cases, many of these civilian buildings may be the family homes of low-level Hamas fighters or, or individuals suspected of being low-level Hamas fighters and that these buildings are being targeted uh, often when those uh, fighters are not present. So if that is correct, then in my view, these buildings would not be military objectives at all because they would not make an effective contribution to military action and their destruction would not offer a definite military advantage. What the article indicates is that um, many of these buildings are being uh, targeted because they have uh, a, a sort of, you know, some connection to Hamas, some alleged connection to Hamas, but that the actual purpose is what is called civil pressure. Uh, the idea is that the scale of the destruction will cause uh, Gazan civilians to rise up against Hamas. It's very important to emphasize that um, psychological effects on a civilian population are not a legitimate military advantage. So they don't count toward making uh, an object a military objective, and they cannot offset uh, predictable harm to civilians. It's also worth emphasizing that the attacks, the primary purpose of which is to spread terror among a civilian population are specifically prohibited. And the line between you know, spreading terror undermining civilian morale and uh, inciting, you know, revolt against the governing authority is not really a line worth drawing. These are all kind of bound up together. Um, so all of this indicates uh, violations of basic principles of distinction in the bombing campaign. With respect to proportionality, and so as Tom mentioned, this is proportionality with respect to specific attacks. Uh, essentially weighing the foreseeable harm to civilians against the anticipated military advantage from the strike. What appears to be happening is that the Israeli Defense Forces are accepting a much higher level of foreseeable civilian harm than they have in the past, and a much higher level than uh, other advanced militaries. So if you look at the US-led um, campaign against ISIS in Iraq and Syria, uh, it's worth looking at this campaign because it was a, a very brutal campaign. And in aggregate, a large number of civilians were killed. And the adversary like Hamas was a non-state armed group that with, had a, a very high degree of military capability and was dug into urban centers. And yet in that campaign, we, we really don't see any incidents 
in which um, particular uh, operations were authorized, knowing that the attack in question would kill dozens or, or in some cases, over 100 civilians. Um, and yet that has been what we have seen in the IDF's campaign in Gaza. So most notably, we saw an airstrike on the Jabalia refugee camp uh, that killed at least 100 civilians, at least 69 of them children. Uh, and this was confirmed by Air Wars in a subsequent investigation. Uh, the apparent target of the strike was a, a, a kind of a local regional commander, not at the most senior level, but at, at, at sort of a kind of an upper middle level, uh, as well as a number of fighters and an underground tunnel. Now, these are certainly significant military advantages. Uh, I don't mean to, to trivialize them, uh, but the idea that they could justify killing so many civilians for knowingly, knowingly, um, is something that I, I don't think most advanced militaries would, would accept. Uh, the, this was not uh, a game changer. This was not uh, a decisive moment in the prosecution of the war as a whole. It didn't change the course of the hostilities. Uh, it was just one tactical encounter among countless others uh, in the overall military campaign. And the fact that the IDF was, was willing to carry it out, uh, knowing that so many civilians would be killed, uh, indicates that they are adopting a expansive, uh, and I would say uh, a distorted view of proportionality uh, that, that few other states would, uh, would accept. Thank you. Uh, in this next round of questioning, I'll ask that perhaps you could each um, give uh, answers of only a couple of minutes so we can fit more questions in. Um, sorry, I wanted to ask you about the use of aid and hostages uh, and detainees as bargaining chips. At the end of November, there was a temporary pause in the fighting. It enabled the release of dozens of Israeli hostages held by Hamas in exchange for hundreds of Palestinians held in Israeli detention facilities along with an increase in humanitarian aid. You wrote posts on social media emphasizing the point that despite the understandable joy and relief on both sides at these developments, hostages, detainees, and aid should not be used as bargaining chips in this way. Could you elaborate on this view and explain what you found troubling about these exchanges um, and uh, maybe address what the obligations of Israel, the United States, and other nations are with respect to hostages? detainees uh, and aid. Yeah, thank you. Um, so holding hostages is a war crime um, and all civilian hostages need to be immediately and unconditionally released. It was a war crime to take them and it's a war crime to continue to hold them. Deliberately impeding the rapid supply of life-saving humanitarian aid and doing so in order to collectively punish the civilian population is also a war crime and civilians at Gaza have a right to receive that aid irrespective of anything else. I think what was difficult was watching those things being bargained, you know, women and children waiting to see if they would become free depending on whether or not Hamas did certain things on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, children in Gaza waiting to see if they would get food depending on whether um, the Israeli, uh, whether, um, sorry, I'm not mixing it up, <laughs> each side uh, making those things conditional on the actions of the other side. Um, and just to be clear about that, the, the, the impact of withholding that aid has been um, profound for people in Gaza. And it is not the case that this is the way it's always been. Um, in previous hostilities, as difficult as they have been, the Israeli military has never cut electricity, never cut uh, clean drinking water that it supplied to Gaza, and has always opened its crossings into Gaza for the full panoply of humanitarian aid that people need. Um, one of the first things the Israeli military did was cut electricity, cut water, close its crossings, and keep them closed. And that's part of the reason why um, civilians in Gaza are, are suffering so much. These obligations are non-reciprocal um, and, and they shouldn't be bargained. In terms of um, responsibilities, so I, I would say that, um, I would maybe add to Tom's comment about the risk of complicity. The countries who are supplying arms to the Israeli military and to Palestinian armed groups 
are risking complicity in these grave abuses um, by, by knowingly supplying those arms. And I'm talking in particular about Iran, which is supplying Hamas and Islamic Jihad, and the United States, the UK, Germany, and Canada, which are supplying the Israeli military. And that's why Human Rights Watch has asked for them to suspend military assistance uh, as well as um, arms transfers um, at this time. Um, uh, in terms of refugee law, I, I agree with Tom that Egypt has an obligation to open its borders for people fleeing. Uh, there are many concerns um, that the Israeli policy risks being forced displacement, um, pushing people to flee to Egypt, but that's an individual decision. Families get to make those impossible choices of whether they want to flee. The Israeli authorities have that same obligation. Israel is also a neighboring country uh, of Gaza, and Israel has an obligation to open its borders to people from Gaza who are fleeing. And by the way, about a million of them or more have a right to return anyway, because they are refugees from 1948. Thank you. Uh, Adil, I'd like to ask you um, about warnings. So a lot of attention has been given to the warning systems that Israel uses to alert civilians in Gaza that specific buildings or neighborhoods will be bombed. The methods used include maps, texts, phone calls, leaflets dropped from the sky. And the IDF often points to these efforts as proof that it is fulfilling its obligations to minimize civilian casualties. Can you explain for us how international law treats the use of warnings in this context? Are they required? And if so, is the IDF meeting its legal obligations in this respect? Thanks. Um, so IHL does require uh, effective advanced warnings of attacks that may affect civilians um, in the context of a range of precautionary obligations. Uh, so it's almost like a checklist. Uh, first, verify that your target is really military and not civilian. Next, choose means and methods of warfare, basically weapons and tactics that will avoid or minimize harm to civilians, avoid disproportionate attacks. And then when you've done all of that and the attack that you're contemplating is fully in compliance with IHL in all other respects, then if possible, you should give effective advanced warning to civilians uh, to flee the area uh, for their additional safety. I, I think two things tend to get uh, missed in this discussion. So the first is that the attack has to be lawful prior to the warning. It has to be the case that the attack would be lawful even if the civilians remained in place. So telling civilians, uh, you know, in a, uh, an apartment building, um, we are about to destroy your building, leave, uh, is not a warning that is a threat because you are threatening to kill a very large number of civilians uh, for little or no military advantage. Um, so that's not a warning because you're you're telling them that you're going to do something that would be illegal right? unless they unless they leave. The other thing that I, I think has has happened is that the way Israel has um, designed its overall military campaign it, it has created a situation in which there is no safe place for Gazan civilians to go. So it, the assumption, if you will, in IHL is that if you give civilians effective advance warning of one attack, then they will be able to flee to safety uh, somewhere else. Um, but I, I think we're now in a in a situation where there is no safe place for Gazan civilians to go. And so that the rationale for the requirement to give warnings where feasible has to some extent been undercut. None of this is to say that these warnings make things even worse, um, but it is to say that they don't make things that much better. And so that the other issues that we've discussed, whether it's the impeding of humanitarian relief uh, and simply the scale of the bombardment as a whole, I have created a context in which these warnings cannot really achieve the purpose for which they would be in principle required. Thank you. And finally, Tom, a question for you on uh, human shields and civilian immunities. Um, as you know, one factor that makes fighting in Gaza different than some other armed conflicts is that Hamas militants do not wear uniforms or operate as the regulated army of a nation state. They're embedded in a dense civilian population and they store weapons in and fire rockets and other weapons from 
locations that are either in or closely adjacent to buildings where civilians work or live. These circumstances are often summarized by referring to the use of human shields. Can you walk us through how international law treats the use of human shields? Is this practice itself unlawful? And if so, how are adversaries supposed to respond to it? And do civilians who are used as human shields lose any of their protections? How has Israel handled this situation in the current hostilities and has its response been lawful? Thanks, John. So I'll try and move through three different points quite quickly because I know we're running short on time. The first is the concept of passive precautions. The second, the issue of human shields. And the third, the implications of the use of human shields for the other party in an armed conflict, the party that's not itself using those shields. So the passive precautions obligations, the obligations that each party bears to protect to the maximum extent feasible, the civilians under its control from the effects of military operations, including the military operations of the adversary. That, for example, includes to the maximum extent feasible, avoiding the co-location of military objectives and civilians or civilian objects. There are two things about this rule that are relevant here. First, it's a feasibility test. That means it's often difficult to apply in the context of battle over densely populated urban environments because the co-location of civilians and combatants and civilian objects and military objectives is to a certain extent inevitable in that kind of context. So the passive precaution obligation is a feasibility obligation. It's an obligation to do the maximum extent feasible. We can't determine from any specific instance of co-location whether that was a violation. The second is that these obligations don't underpin a war crime. It's only once the violation rises to the level of human shielding that the war crime attaches. And what's distinctive about human shielding as distinct from the passive precautions obligations is that the rule is not to take advantage of co-location with civilians, or civilian or other protected persons or protected objects with a specific view to shielding oneself or military objectives from attack by the adversary or with a specific view to otherwise impeding the military operations of the adversary. So the key thing is to prove that specific intent, to prove that there was an intent to shield or to impede. The final point is that when human shields are being used, and I think it's credible, there's credible evidence that that's indeed the case in this current conflict, that Hamas has used human shields in violation of that prohibition. That does not relieve the other party of any of its obligations under international humanitarian law vis-a-vis -vis the civilians that are being used as human shields. If one were to think about international humanitarian law as exclusively or primarily a framework for ensuring a fair fight between the two parties, one might think that is an odd result because one party's violation would make it harder for the other party to comply with its obligations. But that's not the core or primary purpose of international humanitarian law particularly on these kinds of issues, that purpose is instead to protect the civilians from the effects of hostilities. And it would be perverse if being unlawfully endangered by one party that's criminally using human shields would reduce one's legal protection vis-a-vis -vis the operations of the other party, thereby compounding what was already an unlawful endangerment. And it's important to bear in mind here, particularly with reference to your question about whether Israel is complying with its IHL obligations, and really the question just reverts back to the analysis that Adel was just giving, because it's about whether it's complying with proportionality, distinction, discrimination and attacks and so on, that the responsibility of one party for the ultimate consequence for the civilians that are used as human shields and then harmed in an attack as a result of that, the responsibility of one party for that wrong cannot diminish or in any other way mitigate the responsibility of the other party. The fact that one party is responsible has no bearing on whether the other party is also responsible. Two actors can be responsible for the same wrongful outcome without it in any way diminishing the responsibility of the other. Just as when two individuals join together to commit a crime, the fact that they're doing together doesn't mean that they're in any way exculpated or their responsibility is any way mitigated as compared to if they did it individually. Thank you so much. Our time is drawing to a close, so I'd like to uh, conclude by inviting each of you just to take 30 seconds or a minute, perhaps, to make a final comment on any topic um, that you'd like. Let me begin with you, Adil. 
And then I'll go to you, Tom, and then give you, sorry, the last word. Thanks. Um, let me go back to something that Tom said at the very beginning um, about international law. You know, international law is a set of rules, standards, and principles. In and of itself, it cannot do anything. What it can help, or it affects what we can do uh, with it. Uh, so international law on its own will not save a single life or stop a war. But what it can do is give us a um, set of standards that we can invoke uh, in demanding that lives be spared and that a war end. Um, I'd say the same about international institutions. I know that since uh, Friday, when the United States uh, vetoed a Security Council resolution that would have called for a ceasefire, the immediate release of all hostages, and the unimpeded um, access of, of humanitarian relief, uh, that there has been um, uh, there have been um, concerns that international institutions are failing. This was a failure of, of one state, of the government of one state, uh, uh, blocking what would have been a life-saving, potentially life-saving act. And, and I think that as we um, demand, uh, you know, an end to illegal acts and an end to the conflict as a whole, international law can play a role because it can give us a shared set of standards that we can invoke without going all the way down to first principles. So we can say that given the range of violations committed by both Hamas and the IDF over the last two months, uh, that there is no reason to think that they are suddenly going to snap into compliance. And that if the two parties are not prepared to fight by the rules, that they cannot simply cannot be allowed to fight uh, at all. And so as much as IHL is important in containing uh, the way the war is fought, it can also provide us with a basis for saying that the war must simply end. Thank you. Tom? So just building on Adol's comment there about international law being a tool that we can use or a focal point for our own political action, I think the utility of that tool in any specific context is diminished to the extent that it is not used equally across contexts. And here I think we should look at the reaction to the escalation of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022 and the response to that as the standard against which other uses of international law, particularly the bodies of law that we've been discussing today, including international humanitarian law and international criminal law, should be evaluated. So the fact that over 40 states referred the situation in Ukraine to the International Criminal Court, the fact that multiple states have engaged in universal jurisdiction investigations with respect to eligible crimes in the context of Ukraine, the fact that multiple states have supplied support in kind and financial both to the International Criminal Court and to the Ukrainian domestic criminal justice system, the fact that they have stood alongside Ukraine as intervening third parties at the International Court of Justice or at the European Court of Human Rights, those facts suggest a willingness to use international law in a particular context. But that use will not be effective if it is not seen by the rest of the world as also a use that will inform reactions in other contexts. And so when thinking about the reaction to Gaza, the question to any state that has reacted in the ways that I just described vis-a-vis -vis the situation in Ukraine should be, why are you not reacting in the same way in this context? Some states have taken notable action in that respect, and so they should be lauded and that that kind of support should be encouraged. But where it's not forthcoming or where there's deliberate obstruction of particular efforts to use the tools of international law, whether it's the advisory opinion that's pending at the International Court of Justice, whether it's the International Criminal Court's investigation, or whether it's the pursuit of universal jurisdiction investigations, would itself undermine the utility of the tool of international law across the board. Thank you. And sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, I share Tom's concern about selectivity in upholding international standards. I think that here there's actually an opportunity maybe to try to um, build back up um, the credibility and potential of the International Criminal Court 
because one of the one of the deep concerns about the International Criminal Court has been selectivity, um, in particular um, selective Western support for the ICC's investigation and relatively rapid arrest warrants against Russian officials, but the um, opposition of at least some Western states, notably the United States, to uh, ICC investigations um, into Israel and into um, the United States itself in the case of Afghanistan. And what, what we're seeing now is something very interesting because Israeli victims are now embracing ICC jurisdiction. Um, and, you know, the, the Israeli government was uh, sort of forced to allow the ICC prosecutor to visit Israel at the demand of family members of, um, of the hostages who'd been taken and other victims of October 7th. And, you know, the, the investigation into Palestine has not produced visible results, but this could be an opportunity to actually move forward because the, the fact that there is now support, at least among some sectors in Israel, for the ICC investigation could make it easier for the prosecutor to move forward, and I hope that he does. Thank you very much. I believe that Melissa Gregory will be rejoining us to bring the webinar to a close. Let me just end by thanking all of you for such a rich and informative discussion. Uh, while we couldn't address every relevant topic today, we did cover a lot of ground, and all of us are grateful for your analysis and insights. So thank you. I have very little to add to that, uh, except again, thank you so much. That was a sobering and extremely illuminating conversation. I wish we had more time with it. Um, thank you again to our panelists for your nuanced and informed analysis, and many thanks to our virtual audience for logging in. With that, we conclude the uh, 2023 Mikhail Memorial Lecture. Thank you.